She died of inflammatory breast cancer, so it's, it's a very aggressive form of breast cancer. Um, she first developed it when she was 61, and then she died when she was 68. So most of the time, it, she was in treatment, and it was only the very end that nothing was working. And she, they introduced her to the palliative program at the Princess Margaret, when they got to the last, they were using the last medication that they were going to try. <clears throat> and then at that point, um, she met the palliative doctor, and so she was seeing both the oncologist and the palliative doctor, and then we started to discuss end-of-life scenarios. So, so, so when you're at the Princess Margaret, you're you're automatically, or if you stay under their treatment, you sign a do not resuscitate. So we knew that. So it sort of uh, opens the subject up. Do you mean optionally you sign it, or that's a requirement? You have to. Oh. If you're going to go into the hospital, you have to. Mm. I'm not sure about the exact rules now, but she did sign it, and you're encouraged to. My mom decided not to die in hospital. She wanted to die at home, but she didn't really. There was no really. Uh, there was no real plan as to who's going to take care of her. So it was me. And there were people, friends that visited during the daytime, but the, there was no caregiver except for me. Um, so in the day, I would be rushing out here and there, and then she would be up overnight, and it it, it was a like a twenty-four hour thing for a little while there. So that was kind of hard. Uh, one of the doctors came in, and he was a young guy, and he went and talked to my mother, and um, she said, I'm not going to the hospital, I'm staying here. And he said, and so I said, oh, tell her that she has to, we have to get a nurse in to stay overnight. And she told, he told her, okay, you have to get a nurse in. And she said, no, no, Cindy can handle it. <laughs> no, no, she can't. You have to get a nurse in. And so for some reason, he listened to, she listened to the doctor because he was a doctor. And then he came out and he was laughing his head off. And he said, has she always been like that? Like, like what? Really stubborn? And I said, yeah, I guess so. So it was, it was very good for me to have somebody from the outside come in and see the humor in the situation. Like you hear about how wonderful it is to die at home. It, it's not really a magical thing, and you actually have to be prepared for it, and it has to be planned out, and uh, you, unless you have a large family with 20 aunts that are helping out, you have to get some, some help, and one of those aunts should be a nurse. You know, that would be, it would work out that way. Right. Um, so, and if you're, when you're planning to die, or you're you're expecting to die, you should think of that too. Think about your family and uh, what would be doable for them. And dying at home, you know, you've you've got problems with your pain medication. You've got to wait till the doctor comes over, and increases your prescription, which would probably go a little faster in the hospital. Right. Um, so it's not. I, I don't think it's as romantic as people think. I took leave. We took this one trip to the oncologist, or to, it wasn't the oncologist at that point, it was the palliative doctor, and she felt like the trip over was terrible. The, the taxi, you know, the car trip, she was all white. It was just like it was too much to take the trip. So I said, when the doctor was there, I think I should take leave now because if you're feeling this crappy, I think you should have somebody around. And so at that point I took leave. Um, I had lots of uh, vacation saved up and I had plans to, when I ran out of vacation to go into that. Um, you, can, you can collect um, unemployment insurance for a certain length of time. We had a meeting closer to the end and it was the palliative doctor and it was a, there was like a team. And she said, no, I'm not coming to the hospital, I'm going to die at home. And so at that point, I should have said, well, we're going to have to work something out that somebody comes in and helps out, and somebody who knows medication. And 
just nursing stuff, like if somebody just lies there to get a bed sore, and so you've got to move them around. Well, I didn't know any of that. So I, I really did need some professional help. And that, that wasn't recommended or suggested by others on their team? No, they didn't say, okay, you have to get somebody in. They didn't say that. And the I know when a friend of mine, her dad died 20 years ago, uh, it was all covered under OHIP. They had nurses come in. Ours, well, we had to pay privately. So it was just a few days we had uh, palliative nurses coming in, and it was great. It made the situation much better. So I did a few days without them, and then the last couple days they were there. And um, so I got to sleep at night. That was the main thing. She wasn't thrilled. Uh, when she was in a coma, we, you know, she had nothing to say about it. <laughs> Until then, no, I don't want strangers in here. We actually got two. We got a nurse and a nurse's aide. And we had them for maybe it was two days and two nights. And then the third day she died. And it was very good. They were one of them, at least the the main nurse, the nurse, registered nurse. She was, uh, she was specializing in palliative care. And so she knew what to do with a dead body. So that was really helpful. Um, not being experienced myself, it was, like it's really good to have somebody around who knows what they're doing. So yeah, it's, it's good to get help when you need help. Mm -hmm. What worried me about it was that we could afford it, um, but I know it was it was about a thousand dollars for the three days. So what happens? With people who have nobody, I, I mean, it was or don't can't afford it financially. That was worried me about it. So there was one public health nurse that would come in and said, oh, "Well, really, she needs to go to the hospital," and she said, "You get out of here!" <laughs> and she kicked her out. Okay, <laughs> she's gone now. And so her boss phoned and said, "Oh, you know, we've never had a complaint before," and he said, "Don't uh, take it personally. It was somebody was going to get that." Somebody was telling her she's going to die, and she accepted it to a certain extent. I know I have a friend whose dad said, no, I'm not going to die, and he was using crystals, and so they never said goodbye, because he was always, you know, by tomorrow he would be better. So she wasn't in denial to that extent, um, but she just wanted it her way. I think at the end she was she was saying, Okay, okay, I'm going to die in three days. This is how it's going to be. So it was like she was still fighting it to the end. So it wasn't so much, I think some some people seem to accept it better and are able to talk about it, uh, but her not so much. Uh, the palliative doctor told me, the one, the visiting doctor, he told me that people generally, their personality traits become stronger right. near the end. She had more appreciation um, for for me, and uh, she did say that. I hope you know when you die, your daughters treat you as well as you've treated me. That was very sweet. Um, so that was good. Yes, yeah, there was appreciation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, she was in pain, and so there was more. F well, the problem was was they were giving her codeine. And that made her nauseated. So her comfort level was very low. And finally said, no, I think she, like she's having a problem with the codeine. And we have to switch to something that doesn't bother her stomach. And then they switched to morphine in a drip. And so that was much better. Um, but I know she would give me this when she was, I don't know what stage she was in. Sort of partially in a coma, like halfway in a coma. And she would squeeze my hand and I, I would give her a good shot of morphine at that point. You know, the way that you access the various um, services that were available, it was really hard to fit that into a short period of time. Mm -hmm. So I was calling for a hospital bed, and then I phoned and said, no, no, we don't want a hospital bed, because she was more comfortable in her own bed. And then the nurses came and said, no, no, you need a hospital bed. And I phoned and they said, I'm sorry, um, I've changed my mind. I want a hospital bed. Promise won't change my mind again. And then I phoned and said, well, she died, so I don't need the hospital bed. So it was stuff like that. It was, it was changing really quick and difficult to figure out. I just wished uh, we could have somehow planned it out 
and it was it wasn't so so much trial by trial and error because it's like there's a lot going on to be sort of figuring things out and I don't know how that can it's like you don't do it all the time so I'm not sure how that can happen probably it would have had to been somebody who had recently done it because it seems like as the years go on it changes so somebody who was like where do you get a nurse um, so that it might have been more helpful to have since you're at the hospital you have the palliative team if they can sort of give you your options options other than coming into their their unit there so that was the only option. Or stay home and then deal with it. Honestly. Yeah, it, it was like that. There was a doctor that would, the, her doctor did come by a couple of times, uh, or once. And, um, but no, for day-to-day -day care, you were on your own. I was on my own.